Hello Giga Chads and welcome back to the channel. Sorry I missed a video this past week on Thursday. I was starting to make it on like Tuesday and then I thought I came up with a distributed consensus algorithm and then I spent like two hours trying to figure out if I actually did and it's still kind of unclear to me whether I did. So I'm either going to be a billionaire or I wasted two hours. Either way the EV is pretty good. But uh, yeah, without a doubt, now I actually have to make a YouTube video. So let's go ahead and get into it for today. All right, so the topic of today's video is going to be linearizable storage. So what is linearizable storage? Why do we need it? Uh, how is it relevant for the subject matter that we've covered so far? Well, basically we need it for, let's say, correct reads. So imagine that I'm building a distributed lock meaning that we have one node that uh, you know kind of holds the lock on it but a bunch of different clients need to be able to grab it and if that node goes down we need to make sure that basically the person who is holding the lock is still holding that lock right we need to be distributed and tolerant in the face of faults so that is going to be you know let's say just one person can hold that lock and that invariant needs to stay true additionally for something like a database leader, it needs to be the case that there's only one database leader, and if for some reason that leader were to go down, that we don't uh, switch in a way that is going to kind of contradict what everyone in the system believes and understands. That leader can't come back up and then be a second leader all of a sudden. So linearizable storage, for me to kind of summarize it, is this kind of black box here of a database system where it is both fault tolerant and all of the rights are ordered. So what does it allow us to do if all of the rights are ordered? Well, it basically means that if we know the order of the rights, we can make sure that our reads never go back in time, right? If write one is saying, uh, you know, like node A is leader, and then, you know, all of a sudden I read write two saying node B is leader, there should be absolutely no possibility that I later then read that node A is leader or else our storage is not linearizable. I kind of just went back in time in my system and now our entire constraints and invariants forcing everything to be correct have been completely messed up. So how do we actually order our writes? Let's look at a few examples that we've spoken about. Uh, so let's start with single leader replication, for example. The way that we order our writes within our nodes is a replication log. The replication log basically says, you know, we've got a write one and a write two and a write three and you send that replication log from the leader to the followers. And by doing so, we know that the leader and the followers, so all of the nodes in our cluster, agree on the order of all the writes. What about multi-leader and leaderless replication? Well, obviously this is gonna be a little bit more challenging simply because of the fact that now our writes can go to a bunch of different places and we can have concurrent writes. So how can we establish an order across them? We can't really establish a correct order, right? It's not really possible to say like, hey, I know for a fact that the write on one node came before another node, but we can establish an order that is consistent among the nodes, right? So we can get all the nodes to agree on the ordering of the writes. And how can we do that? Well, we could use something like version vectors or a Lamport clock. So just as a reminder to everyone, a version vector is what we have shown over here, where as you can see, we've got say, like the version vector on the left says three comma one, and the version vector on the right says two comma two. So on the right database node, uh, you've seen two updates from the left database node and two updates from the right database node. And on the left database node, we've seen three updates from the left database node and one update from the right database node. Now it's important to note that because three comma one and two comma two are kind of interleaved, right? Like three is greater than two, but one is less than two, that these two version vectors are concurrent. And so technically there's no complete order, right? We can assign a complete order where we would say like, okay, in a tiebreaker, choose the version vector where, you know, the left kind of index is greater, right? So we could say in tiebreakers, we arbitrarily choose an ordering. And that's effectively what we do with Lamport clocks as well. The one big difference with Lamport clocks is that version vectors take O of N space where N is the number of replicas. So if I added a third guy over here, now all of a sudden our version vectors need three elements. Lamport clocks always exclusively take two elements, and so as a result they're a bit more compact to determine the ordering in multi-leader and leaderless replication. So let's quickly learn how those work. So this is going to be a little bit of a complicated slide, but let's go ahead and talk about it. So I mentioned that Lamport clocks take constant space, O of 1, 
So how do they work? Let's imagine we have one client over here on the left side of our screen, another client on the right side of our screen, and the point is they're gonna be making concurrent writes and we wanna be able to order them. So let's call this database B, we'll call this database A. And so the point here is that every single kind of element of our system, uh, both the client, the databases, and the other client, all have a local counter. And so as you can see, that's all gonna start at zero. I have them lined up right here, B, zero, zero. And the point is every single time that you make a write, you're going to increment your counter, both on the client and the database. However, the kicker is that you don't just increment your counter by one, oftentimes you do, but you actually take the max of the counter that's currently on the client and the database that the write is going to, and you add one to that. So just to show things off, since clients are both starting, let's start over here. Since both clients are starting with a counter of zero and both databases are starting with a counter of zero, when you perform the write, you perform a write and everyone increments their counter to one. Because you're going to say, well, this guy was at zero, this guy was at zero, they're writing to one another. So increment both the client and the database counter to one, do the same thing on the top. Now, what's gonna happen is that client two is going to write to database B again. So as you can see, this write is now going to be B comma two because the write is going to database B and the counter on the client is two. Now what's gonna happen is that this client is going to write again over here, but this time to node A. And so you can see that the counter is going to be A comma three. So why is it A comma three instead of A comma two? Because keep in mind that the counter on node A was still only one. The reason it's three is because the counter on client two was already two. So what we do is we take the max of the two possible counters, we add one to it, and that is our new Lamport clock number. So we have A comma three, and then the same thing over here, when client zero, or client one rather, is going to write to node A, we're going to take the max of the two counters. So recall that A already had a counter of three at this point from the last write and client one had only a counter of one from over here, and we're gonna add one to it, and now we have four. So this all seems very arbitrary. What am I getting at here? The point is you can assign a Lamport timestamp to every single write, and then once we've assigned those Lamport timestamps to every single write, we can actually express an ordering over our writes that is total. We don't have a concept of concurrency here because what we can do to settle ties when things have the same counter is we can just pick an order of the nodes. So let's say the rule is basically that first we're going to sort by counter, and then if there's a tie in counter, we sort by node. So that means that A1, this guy over here, is our first write. Then we have B1, this guy over here. Then we have B2, which makes sense because two is the next highest counter, or rather, you know, the next lowest counter. Then we have A comma three because three is going to be the next lowest one. And then finally A comma four because four is the next lowest number. Notice that when we have two things with the same counter value, A1 and B1, that the fact that we use the node tiebreaker there means that A1 comes first because we will choose A first since that is our arbitrary node ordering that we've chosen. So this is one way that we can actually implement a complete ordering over all of our writes in a leaderless or multi-leader replication setup. However, it still does not create linearizable storage. The reasoning being because of the fact that in this setup, while we are able to create an ordering over our writes, the ordering is kind of after the fact. Okay, so let's go ahead and go through this example of how things might not necessarily be linearizable in a multi-leader replication setup, even if you are using Lamport clocks to order the writes. Let's imagine I have a client and he is gonna be hanging out right here. So the first thing that's gonna happen is we've got a couple of writes that have gone to each of our databases. One is x equals one to the left database, and then the other is going to be x is equal to five on the right database. So you can see now that the x is equal to five is technically the later write because it has this b equals one Lamport timestamp. So this is the later write. So let's imagine basically that I first read from this node over here and I get that x is equal to one. Then, I now go ahead and read from this node over here and get x is equal to five. And then one more time, I'm going to read from my left node and get that x is equal to one. <clears throat> Even though eventually, once these nodes kind of converge and replicate their state to each other, where we see x is equal to five and it gets over here, 
then we'll be in good shape. But until that replication actually happens, we can read these writes out of order because we know that x is equal to 5 comes after e x is equal to 1 because it is the later write. So as long as we have the propensity to be able to read these writes out of order, our storage is obviously not going to be linearizable. So let's actually go ahead and talk about single leader replication because you might be thinking to yourself, well, obviously if all the writes go through one node, that's got to be linearizable, right? We discussed how there's a replication log. But actually, it's not. So how is it not linearizable? Well, let's go ahead and take a look. So let's imagine the first thing that's going to happen is we write to our left database over here. Let's call this the leader. We're going to write x is equal to 5 to it. And then we're going to write x is equal to 10 to it. So the replication log looks something like this. x equals 5, x equals 10. And so we're going to send over x is equal to 5 to our follower. And then once we basically do that, what we can do is have our client over here. The first thing our client is going to do is read x is equal to 5 from the leader. The second thing they're going to do is do another read from the leader. And now you can see, oh wait, x is actually equal to 10. However, if our leader goes down during this time and x is equal to 10 has not yet actually gotten to the follower, when you read again from the follower, you're going to see that x is equal to 5 because the write has not yet been propagated. So this is not a fault tolerant linearizable storage solution. Even though a single node is itself linearizable, the whole point is this is distributed systems. We need to figure out a way such that when nodes fail, we can still be sure that our writes are only being read in that same order. So what we actually need is something called total order broadcast. And what that means is that everything Every single write that is published to the system is agreed upon by every single node. Not necessarily every node, but it's agreed upon by the storage system in a way such that it exhibits linearizable reads, meaning that your reads are never going back in time. Because again, if you're holding a lock and you're basically just holding that, and then all of a sudden the system thinks that a previous owner of the lock is the one holding it, you're in huge trouble. So ultimately, what does this come down to? We need something called distributed consensus. So that is going to be the topic of the next video. This was mainly just a primer for it, why we need distributed consensus, what it's useful for. But yeah, hopefully that makes things very clear. So guys, I will see you in the next one. I have got to run to the gym because I just ate a bunch of donuts and I'm feeling pretty thick. And uh, yeah, have a great weekend, everyone.